and welcome back to another session on methodology of literature. We continue with reader response theory. We will start David Blake. Now, David Blake, his theory is based on subjective reader response. It completely relies on readers' responses to the text. And these responses are then compared with other responses or interpretations of other readers. And thus, they try to find meaning from the interpretations of the readers. Thus, the reader responses are the text. The reader's responses, they are the text. That is, in a sense that there is no literary text beyond the meanings created by the reader's interpretation. Thus, what the critic analyzes, the critic when he analyzes the text, he is not analyzing the literary work, rather he looks at the written responses of the readers. So, in subjective criticism, uh, David Bleak presents a shift from the objective to the subjective paradigm. He also differentiates between real and symbolic objects. Real objects or real objects are the ones that is physical, concrete, objects like animals, trees, cars, buildings, etc. The printed pages of the text are real objects. But the experiences created when someone reads the text, that is the printed pages, is symbolic. Uh, because it occurs not in the physical world, but in the conceptual world, that is in the mind of the reader. Symbolification or symboli sorry, symbol, uh, symbolization to bleak is the perception or identification in the reading experience. Again, I repeat, in the reading experience, symbol, uh, symbolization. Symbolization to bleak is the perception or identification in the reading experience which creates a conceptual or symbolic feeling or world in the mind of the readers. That is the experience, he experiences the conceptual world. Okay, that is symbolization. Textual on the other hand means a process, a process where one interprets the meaning of the conceptual experience in response to the text. Here you interpret the conceptual world. So in symbolization you experience the conceptual world, in textual you interpret the conceptual world. Clear? So that is if one likes a text say a poem or a novel or a drama or a short story or a painting or a movie, art or any text, he or she likes it, uh, then he or she likes his symbol, uh, symbolization. Okay? And if he or she does not like it, then he or she dislikes his or her symbolization. The text one interprets exists in the mind of the reader and no, no text exists otherwise. It is all in the mind of the reader. It is very subjective rather than objective because there is a shift from the objective method to the subjective one. So it is all to do with the responses of the readers okay? and uh, that is how they interpret a text. Next we have Norman Holland. Now Ho Norman Holland, he uh, brings Freudian psychoanalysis into the reader response theory. He states that the reader's motives are strongly influenced or the, the reader's motives strongly influences their re uh, reading. So the re the, their reading is influenced by their motives. He favors the transactional reader response theory. He believes that reading involves a transaction between the reader and a real text. He calls this analysis transactive. He is sometimes or he uh, sometimes referred to uh, 
he is also referred to as subjective reader response critic for his emphasis on the subjective nature of the text. His theories involves psychoanalysis and he here he claims that the reader's interpretation of literature or literary text reveals more about themselves and not about the text. Here, so uh, Norman Holland he uses this to find how it affects the mind of the reader. It's all about the reader's interpretation and how it reveals more about the reader's uh, mind and it's not about the text. Here it's not the text but the ra rather the reader's mind is what is being uh, analyzed. Thus it is also called psychological reader response criticism. Any interpretation has its real and um, the text uh, or it has a real end. There is a purpose, any interpretation, whatever the interpretation is, it has a purpose, it has a real end. And that is this real end is to fulfill our psychological needs or desires. Maybe it helps us to cope with, uh, cope, uh, with our fears. Maybe uh, it helps us to, uh, you know, um, our desires, certain desires which cannot be fulfilled, those desires, fulfilling such type of desires uh, or uh, perhaps uh, uh, through uh, imagination uh, one is able to uh, fulfill his dreams which otherwise cannot be fulfilled in reality. So there are several ways or several uh, uh, in real ends or uh, to uh, this uh, psychoanalytical uh, uh, reading reader response theory. Now, <clears throat> thus we can say that this interpretation is principally a psychological process than an intellectual one. Uh, social response uh, theory by Stanley Fish. Uh, we discussed and Stanley Fish last time and he is uh, on social response. He is all about social, his theory is all about social response and uh, it is against the individualistic nature uh, of the subjective reader response theory. His essay, is there a text in this class argues that there is no individual subject response. According to Fish, the individual subject response to literature is a product of interpretive uh, community, uh, the community to which one belongs and therefore it is a construct. By interpretive community, Fish refers to a set of members who share a particular reading strategy, a set of assumptions. This community consists of informal or sorry uh, this community consists of informed readers who are both linguistically explicit and is thorough with this, with syntax semantics which are tools essential for literary competence and are familiar with the literary conventions or rules they always have institutionalized assumptions Examples, assumptions already established in them through their high school, church, colleges, community, their cultural and philosophical attitudes and so on. These communities are not static and the readers may belong to one or more of these communities at a time. What Fish is trying to say is that a reader who is well read or educated or has attained literary competence necessary to read or experience the text is always regularized and is monitored by this interpretive community. So how can we say that it is an individual subjective response when the reader is already shaped and nurtured by certain or various communities. So their views are not their own. It is a construct by the community they live, their studies, their philosophies, culture all depend on these communities and therefore we cannot say that uh, a reader is um, you know completely he 
is an individual or you cannot go for the individual uh, response of the reader the, because the reader himself uh, has been nurtured and has been shaped by these communities who has ingrained in them set of rules a set of uh, regulations set of constructs so that those constructs already exist in these readers and therefore we cannot say that their uh, viewpoints or their interpretations are uh, individualistic or uh, subjective so he is totally against the subjective nature of reader response uh, theories theorists okay so that's it with the reader response theory we have completed reader response theory and there and now we shall move to psychoanalysis okay now psychoanalysis i shall be discussing freud and lacan uh, i shall only be doing the most important uh, concepts uh, and uh, because uh, your text is mm, very mm, readable you can, you just have to read through you will understand it's not very difficult you to uh, you actually don't require much explanation uh, uh, because it has been very clearly uh, explained uh, the psychoanalysis part that is uh, psychoanalytical criticism uh, but the concepts the most important concepts by uh, these uh, writers shall be explained in the video Uh, psychoanalysis or psychoanalytical criticism was introduced by Sigmund Freud in the later 19th century in his book Introduction to Psychoanalysis in 1920. It was done on his analysis on neurosis. Uh, psychoanalysis is a branch of psychology which focuses on the human mind. That is when you want to study the relationship or you want to study the mind or emotion, the relationship between the conscious and the unconscious mind, our desires, our dreams. Psychoanalytical criticism was used in art and literature to find out the mind of the author and how it was related with his work. So it was used by Freud and later psychoanalysts not only on their patients but also on their on the language or on literature on the text so they would read the text and get the underlying meaning which the writer won't be saying uh, directly basically in psychoanalysis school of criticism you we deal with three important things first one is the dreams and symbols the first one uh, that is the dreams and symbols is when the writer speaks of the of dreams and the uh, reader tries to interpret or uh, the hidden meaning of the dream like for instance or uh, the writer tries to give you the meaning several meanings through the, the so through his dreams for example shashi desh pande in uh, roots and shadows i think in the first uh, or second chapter in the prologue and the first chapter you will find uh, uh, Indu uh, dreaming about uh, they you know moving uh, in a bus or a vehicle uh, and all are inside uh, except one member of the family one member of the family is missing and Indu does not get to understand what the dream is all about but and the Shashi Desh Pandey does not speak or does not even try to interpret the dream to the uh, readers. But towards the end of the novel, things make sense. We understand uh, what this dream was all about when Naran drowns or gets drowned. He dies by drowning. Okay, so um, that is to do with the dreams. Uh, it's one example. Another example is, is the symbols. Uh, again, uh, what I can give you is the uh, dumb waiter. You have studied dumb waiter. Uh, the dumb waiter itself is uh, a symbol, uh, and you have newspaper as a symbol, uh, guns as a symbol, 
yes and you will be studying in the next semester you will be studying death of a salesman where you will again have uh, you know the suitcase as a symbol and so many symbols uh, in uh, the um, uh, play uh, another example would be virginia Woolf's to the lighthouse where lighthouse is a symbol so um, in in literature uh, especially when you are dealing with psychoanalytical school of criticism, you deal with three important things. The first one is dreams and symbols and the second one is a view of the author. Now view of the author is all about text as a window into the mind of the reader. Psychoanalytical criticism imagines text as a display of the author's mind. When you look at the text, you get a lot more about the author. You get more information about the author. Interpreting the text becomes an exercise in finding direct and indirect evidence of the author's childhood, uh, uh, his childhood trauma, his psychological instability and so on. Ultimately, Freud and other psychologists talk about these hidden desires of the author when they look at the book of uh, the author. For example, Emily Dickinson. She follows a different kind of style, her unequal lines, her capitalization, unnecessary capitalization, her use of parentheses at times, her economizing of words. All this gives us hints uh, of Emily Dickins, uh, Dickinson's hidden desires of her mind. So language, through language, we get to understand more about the author. So, according to a psychoanalytical point of view, all these things that she is using is actually governed by her sexual uh, or pleasure seeking motive. Dickinson could have had or she would have had these desires and since these desires uh, you know, couldn't be expressed in the society because the society that she was living in was a very rigid and orthodox society uh, so the uh, the only creative outlet was her poetry so she used poetry to talk about these desires and that too in a way that people would not understand not everybody would uh, understand so that is what the psychoanalytical critics try to point out uh, Dickinson's uh, links uh, Dickinson links sexual desires from pain she gets sexual pleasure when she actually feels the pain. When she actually feels the pain, uh, her desire for death and experiencing the pain is actually a kind of you know uh, linking it with a sexual pleasure, a kind of uh, pleasure seeking uh, that she or pleasure that she gets out of uh, or from pain. Uh, Emily's the reason there is also a reason because of the uh, for this Emily's mother killed herself in front of her and this traumatic experience that she had as a child influenced a lot of her writing and we could interpret her poems keeping these things in mind so traumatic experiences of the author's mind can be seen in the text as well so we look at a text as to interpret the deep desires and thoughts of the author which is in fact or which in fact rises from his or her own un unconscious mind. Now the third point uh, that we have to bear in mind when we study or when we uh, do psychoanalytical criticism is the third point is the psychological makeup or the analysis of the character so the first one is interpretation of dreams and symbols second one is view of the author and the third one is about the characters portrayed in the uh, novel or the play or the poem or whatever so uh, it is uh, the analysis of the uh, character's mind now Shakespeare's characters, they are very complex. For instance, Hamlet again. Hamlet's psychological conflicts that happens with the, uh, or that co conflicts uh, that happens when his mother uh, Gertrude gets married to uh, his uncle 
King uh, Claudius, who actually is a murderer of his own father, and the reason for his uh, con uh, or for his procrastinating the murder is again because of his uh, childhood trauma. It seems so. Uh, the same happens with Lady uh, Macbeth as well. Uh, Lady Macbeth's hand washing, her sleep walking, all these reveals her guilt because she had killed Duncan and she's, she's traumatized by the experience due to her ambition. <clears throat> so psychoanalytical school of criticism deals with analyzing the dreams, the mind of the author and the psychological makeup uh, of the fictional characters that is the characters in the novel or the play okay so next we move on to Sigmund Freud so uh, I shall be explaining uh, some of the uh, important concepts uh, by Sigmund Freud uh, and you are requested to read the textbook because it is easy to understand uh, the concepts however is explained in the video now um, according to Sigmund Freud literature and other arts is are just like dreams a kind of neurotic symptom a kind of madness okay uh, so it is in fact uh, those suppressed emotions that are either denied by reality or society <clears throat> they are similar to dreams uh, and neurotic symptoms um, because when we dream we imagine right we fantasize and it comes from our unconscious maybe our fears maybe our desires maybe some uh, anticipation of future and so on neurotic symptoms also that is madness uh, your conscious mind is no longer in control when you are mad when you are when you are totally out of your mind out of your stable mind when you go insane when you have when you're mad your uh, conscious mind is no longer in your control your unconscious mind takes over so he says literature and art are similar to dreams and neurotic symptoms because they too spring from the unconscious mind. Now how does it happen? See deep in our heart there are many forbidden wishes, especially sexual desires. But they are repressed by something in our conscious called the censor. Okay, So censor is a part of our conscious mind. It is a part uh, in which every individual is forced by it to behave and to live to be normal according to which the society or, the mor or morality demands. It's where we are cultured, we are nurtured and cultured by, the, by education, by our uh, parents, by uh, our society. So the censor is that part of the conscious mind which forces us or forces an individual to behave and live to be normal all right now where do all these emotions repressed by the sensor go when we think our thoughts are not in our control our thoughts our desires our dreams are not in our control so when they come it hits the sensor and whichever is to be suppressed or repressed hmm, by the censor, which is not good to be, you know, uh, uh, or which cannot be approved as proper uh, behavior, gets repressed. And where do these repressed emotions go? These emotions, repressed emotions, are pushed down. The sensor pushes it down to the unconscious realm or the unconscious part of our brain, our mind. So then, when we sleep, we or when we are uh, either when we sleep or when we are troubled, when we are at the loss of our mental balance, we start having distorted images, fantasies. Okay, 
Now, he, uh, uh, how, he tells us how it affects uh, literature and art also. Now, the same thing is what happens to an artist. Now, the artist also has several desires which cannot be uh, fulfilled and he suppresses or he or she suppresses it in his uh, unconscious uh, mind. And what happens is these instead of coming out as dreams and imagination for a normal pe person or a person who is troubled that is normal person in the sense not a writer not an author okay not an artist for the per normal person who is troubled or who sleeps and is hallucinating will have it in the form of dreams and for the writer or an artist what happens is all these repressed emotions by that is by the sensor these are pushed uh, the, the same thing happens these are pushed down to the unconscious realm of the artist's mind and they bring out these hidden desires the, that, that is mostly these sexual desires in a totally different manner which in fact is masked or disguised from reality or real emotions I did tell you about Emily Dickinson's boy. Okay, so uh, these earlier suppressed emotions, they come as distorted images or objects and gets collected in the conscious mind. That is their imagination. And this is recorded and it's, it gets scattered or it gets registered in the conscious mind. So what happens? Their suppressed or repressed emotions are pushed down just like the normal human being. It's pushed down to the realm of the unconscious mind and since he's an artist or a writer what happens is uh, uh, what happens is this these repressed or suppressed emotions gets uh, registered or it gets uh, it comes back or it gets registered or gets scattered in the conscious mind. It gets collected and it gets scattered in the conscious mind. And since these are hideous or maybe the writer has very hideous, very strange, very bizarre um, imaginations or bizarre uh, desires terrible sexual desires mostly Freud speaks about sexual desires so uh, it could be uh, you know terrible sexual desires or it could be um, yeah, something very bizarre very strange very hideous uh, very monstrous that cannot be uh, portrayed or cannot be shown or talked about or even thought or done in the uh, real society and what happens to these hideous uh, savage uh, thoughts that get scattered in the conscious mind from the unconscious mind what happens to them these uh, things uh, when they get collected they form distorted objects or images and in a and when the writer writes he or when he gets or when he uses this his pen his un there is an un there is a you know there is a kind of uh, magic happening not a magic a kind of uh, uh, a strange feeling that happens because uh, when he takes this pen to write his unconscious mind starts working so whatever comes to hit the paper uh, through his conscious mind the uh, the person who is actually doing it or the one who is actually working here is the unconscious mind so all these things that is pushed down to the unconscious mind and gets back to the conscious mind and gets 
scattered to the in the conscious mind it is actually the working of the unconscious mind and it gets scattered in the form of bizarre uh, objects or bizarre images which is masked which is hidden which is disguised okay and the artist being extremely talented is able to hide his deepest desires using what using symbols using objects situations which may not have any direct implication uh, of what he had thought in his mind okay and it can be understood only by analyzing the text with the author all right so i hope you understood that now uh, according to freud there are three chief mechanisms or three um, effect uh, chief uh, mechanisms that affect our unconscious mind and these uh, uh, these three levels uh, or three different levels or three mechanisms uh, or three levels of awareness uh, is the conscious the preconscious and the unconscious mind so our mind can be divided into three some people divide has says it or divides it uh, you know they divide it into two they uh, only uh, speak about the conscious and the unconscious mind but then um, the because the preconscious mind is also a part and parcel of the unconscious mind it seems to them but it's up to you how you want to study it freud divides it into three conscious the preconscious and the unconscious mind now uh, uh, to understand this better uh let us imagine our mind as an iceberg okay and the top part of the iceberg that we can see above is the conscious mind we all know how the titanic sank right it hit against a massive iceberg so we can see only the tip of the iceberg and that part that we can see is the conscious mind okay and the part of the iceberg submerged below the water is and is still visible you can see that slightly you can see it is the subconscious or the preconscious mind and the bulk of the iceberg that lies beneath the uncon uh, is the unconscious mind and we have we cannot see it we have absolutely no idea about the unconscious mind how deep it is how big it is how vast it is we have absolutely no idea so we have the conscious the unconscious uh, the subconscious or the preconscious and the unconscious mind the tip of the uh, iceberg if we can use the an iceberg to compare it the tip of the iceberg is the conscious mind and the uh, the one that is below or the water but is still visible you can still see it is the subconscious or the preconscious mind and the one that you cannot see at all is the unconscious mind okay now knowing this becomes easy for us to understand the three levels of our mind now the conscious this is where we store information at any given time for example you are listening to me so your conscious mind is paying attention to my lecture so the conscious mind includes everything we are aware of it is the smallest section of the entire brain example the words that we learn or hear our, our thirst our hunger our pain that we uh, we experience all that are the functions of the conscious mind now if uh, the next one is the subconscious or the preconscious mind now this subconscious or the preconscious mind contains thoughts and feelings that a person is not currently aware of but which can easily be brought to the con brought to consciousness example things that we know but may not be reminded or we may not remember it now for example what's your phone number tell me 
okay you know it but only when you have a situation where you have to recall it right only when i asked for your phone number you thought of your phone number but you know your phone number right and only when you, you were asked of it you recollected it so it is the part of the uh, mind or it is the part where um, you it contains the thoughts and feelings that a person is not currently aware of but can easily be brought to the brought to consciousness okay so you need to uh, take it to the conscious mind another example would be the number of your car or your scooter or uh, say how your our uh, when we think about uh, the onam celebration that we had uh, when you came in the first year uh, right all these are in your subconscious mind and it's the medium or uh, it's the medium sized section you can definitely bring all these things of your subconscious to your conscious mind whenever it is required right so another like where did you go for your tour so what happens is the name of those places get transported from the subconscious to the conscious mind now when we come to the third section and the most important level of the mind that is the unconscious mind that is a reservoir of feelings of thoughts of urges of memories that are outside our conscious awareness but which has influenced every aspect of our day to day life according to freud the unconscious continues to influence our behavior and our experience even though we are unaware of these influences there are a lot of things which influence our action but we actually don't know about it here we also have basic instincts the instincts of sex of aggression these are primitive ages uh, sorry primitive urges which are there in the unconscious mind the unconscious contains all sorts of disturbing materials which we deliberately keep out of awareness because it is too threatening to acknowledge the <clears throat> unconscious uh, works well when we have dreams example you dream that you are running after a train this is an unconscious thing maybe the train is your career maybe it is your studies you are haunted by thoughts that your career or your studies is running away from you this is an unconscious thing which is hidden uh, in your unconscious layers of mind all right so that's to do with the conscious subconscious or the preconscious and the unconscious realms or the three uh, level of uh, um, awareness according to freud another concept is freud in slip now uh, freud in slip uh, according to freud there are a lot of information that is there in the unconscious and this emerges in the slip of tongues or jokes illness or all the associations we make in our day to day life for example i love my mother okay and i go to her and i hug her and i say mom you are beast okay i intended to say mom you are the best but a slip of tongue made me say mom you are beast this is according to freud because of the unconscious desire it reveals my unconscious anger towards my mother maybe my mother um uh, did not approve of something that i uh, said maybe she is responsible for a certain uh, uh, you know uh, not uh, me getting into uh, perhaps uh, i wanted something very badly but then uh, that was not uh, acknowledged and therefore um, she forced me to take another decision which eventually led to uh, an unhappy situation so that would have been there in my mind long long ago and this comes out 
actually i was not at all aware of it it's there in my unconscious mind now i i just wanted to just hug her now she is uh, i i see her i just want to hug her and uh, tell her mom you're the best but unfortunately what happens is because of slip of tongue it becomes bees because somewhere in the unconscious mind there lies some anger that happened some time in the past Uh, maybe uh, that could have been there that repressed anger would could have been it, it's uh, there in the unconscious mind and this comes out in the form of the slip of the tongue okay so that's another concept by um uh, freud now uh, it's there in your textbook and i want you to find out uh, the name that freud gives for freud in slip it's called freud in slip this concept is called freud in slip but i want you to find out the name uh, it's there in your textbook so a little bit of reading the text will also happen simultaneously so thank you and uh, i'll see you uh, in the next class again with freud we shall discuss freud uh, because freud is a big long chapter uh, a topic uh, so uh, we'll be discussing freud and also lacan we shall try to complete uh, psychoanalytical uh, criticism in the next video so thank you and keep safe